With development underway on the Navy's next generation fighter, currently known as the FAXX, the very makeup of America's Seaward Branch may be resting on its still forming wing roots. Within the list of capabilities the Navy wants to see out of this new fighter, there's one that may literally dictate the relevance of America's most expensive warfighting platforms for decades to come. The Navy's carrier fighters need a big boost in range. Let's talk about this problem. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. As tensions continue to rise between the US and China in the Pacific, America's multi-billion dollar carriers are often called upon to serve as they sort of always have. As a looming American presence in far-flung parts of the globe, the proverbial big stick meant to complement America's diplomatic efforts in other arenas. But for all the power these floating airstrips can bring to bear, these cities on the sea are currently staring down the barrel of a significant capability gap presented by Chinese forces. Their primary offensive capabilities come via the dozens of Joint Strike Fighters and Super Hornets carried on board and not a one of them could reach Chinese targets if a fight were to break out today. At least, not without putting the carriers themselves at pretty serious risk. In order to keep America's flat tops in the fight, there's one thing the Navy's new fighter has to bring with it into service a really big increase in operational range over both the F-A-18 Super Hornet that it's slated to replace and the F-35C Joint Strike Fighter that it'll fly alongside. But to make matters even worse for the engineers trying to solve this problem, that boost in range will have to come from what's almost certain to be a larger jet that the Navy also wants to be faster than either of its precursor siblings. The Navy's FAXX Strike Fighter is being developed within the branch's Next Generation Air Dominance Program, which shares a name and likely some subsystems with the Air Force's effort to develop and field a new air superiority fighter. But sharing an acronym and some modular capabilities appears to be about as far as these programs go, with each branch developing its own advanced aircraft intended to meet their respective needs. And while range is certainly a consideration for the Air Force effort, the Navy has made it clear that it's a priority for theirs. Alongside range, the Navy also wants to prioritize speed and weapon-carrying capacity. These pressing needs were highlighted in the Navy's Aviation Vision 2030 through 2035 document that was released last October. I'll go ahead and quote it here. Its specific capabilities and technologies are under development. However, analysis shows it must have longer range and greater speed, incorporate passive and active sensor technology, and possess the capability to employ longer range weapons programmed for the future. This pressing need for a boost in range really came about as a result of China's growing anti-ship weapon arsenal. China's rapid military modernization and expansion in recent years has really largely been focused on establishing itself as the dominant power within the region. With a naval roster that now exceeds 770 sizable ships with varying degrees of armament and a rapidly growing diesel-powered carrier fleet, China's seafaring forces may still qualify as a green water navy, but within those green waters, it really has few, if any, peers. But while their numerical advantage certainly poses a threat to America's navy, it's really the nation's missiles, not its ships, that have put America's Nimitz and Ford-class supercarriers' futures in jeopardy. China has invested heavily in long-range anti-ship systems, including the operational hypersonic ship-hunting weapon, the DF-ZF, which is carried aloft by the solid-fuel medium-range DF-17 ballistic missile. But that's not the only high-speed boogeyman hiding under the Gerald Ford's bed, because China also has other systems like the DF-21D or the DF-26, which are medium-range and intermediate-range anti-ship ballistic missiles, respectively. Like 
practically all ballistic missiles, these weapons are also capable of achieving hypersonic velocities, though likely without the same degree of maneuverability required of modern hypersonic weapons. The DF-21D, for instance, is claimed to reach Mach 10 before deploying its warheads. While these missiles may technically be easier to intercept than the DF-ZF, in sufficient volume, practically any well-targeted missile attack becomes pretty much impossible to defend against. Saturation attacks are not always a cost-effective or sustainable approach to warfare, but America's aircraft carriers, which take literally years to build and cost more than $10 billion to replace, are exactly the sort of target even accountants could support throwing hundreds of millions of dollars worth of hardware at to bring down. I mean, in terms of cost, a lost carrier just far outweighs the price of any expended munitions. The range of China's various anti-ship weapon systems has been estimated to reach out as far as 1,800 miles or more, which has created what's commonly known as an area denial bubble, extending out over the open waters of the Pacific. Sailing any ship inside this bubble during a conflict would immediately place it at risk of being targeted, with the chances of a successful hit increasing the closer the ship sails to Chinese shores. But there's an important caveat here, because at thousand mile ranges, targeting is no simple enterprise, and even a massive aircraft carrier is a very small and moving target against the sprawling backdrop of the Pacific. There have, however, been some positive assessments of the accuracy of China's anti-ship weapons from American intelligence agencies, and it seems increasingly likely that the nation may really be able to effectively target a vessel at ranges as far away as a thousand miles in the not-too-distant future. China has already been testing supersonic drones to locate and transmit targeting data back to anti-ship missiles, meant to work in conjunction with satellite intelligence and a variety of other surface and airborne sensors. But I want to clarify that these intelligence assessments did not specify whether they were talking about a moving or stationary target at that range, but a carrier in combat operations would almost certainly be moving at a pretty good clip. The Nimitz top speed is listed as 35 miles per hour, and the Fords is listed as better than 35 miles per hour, but I've heard firsthand from more than one admiral who spent a great deal of time aboard America's flat tops that these vessels' real top speeds remain classified, but are quite a bit quicker than publicly disclosed figures. But it seems all but certain that even if China can't accurately target a carrier at 1,000 mile ranges today, they will continue to work toward developing a robust kill chain for their long-range anti-ship weapons. And what that means is the Navy has to plan to keep its flat tops at least a thousand miles away from Chinese shores in any potential conflict, and that creates a huge problem in terms of a carrier's offensive capability. The Navy's current Block II F-A-18 Super Hornets have a combat radius of right around 500 miles while carrying a full weapons payload. That means these jets can take off from a carrier, fly about 500 miles to engage a target, turn tail, and fly 500 miles back to their ship. The Block III variant of the Super Hornet was meant to add conformal fuel tanks, or additional fuel tanks that would hug the fuselage of the aircraft, and it would have allowed them to carry an extra 3,500 pounds of fuel which would have given them an extra 300 miles of range or so, or about 150 miles added to their combat radius. Unfortunately, those plans were shelved last year, but even if they hadn't been, it still would have only extended the Super Hornet's combat radius to around 650 miles. The F-35C, the version of the Joint Strike Fighter meant for carrier duty, has the largest fuel stores of the JSF family, touting a combat radius that may extend as far as 670 miles under the right conditions. Again, that mark falls well short of the range engulfed by China's area denial bubble extending some 1,000 or maybe even 1,200 miles from shore or further in the near future. All this means that even in a best-case scenario, the U.S. Navy would have to sail its carriers within around 650 miles of the Chinese coast to be able to target shoreline assets, placing them well within range of Chinese anti-ship weapons. 
Now, there are already a number of efforts underway aimed at offsetting this range gap, and I go into many of them in much more detail in the full write-up on this topic on Sandbox News. I'll include a link down below. But one of the biggest is the Navy's MQ-25 Stingray, which is a carrier-based drone refueler. The Navy has said the MQ-25 could potentially add as much as 400 miles worth of range to its carrier fighters, and that's even been touted as a way to bring the F-35C up past that 1,000-mile combat radius mark. But it's important to consider where this refueling would have to take place. The MQ-25 is intended to be able to deliver fuel to fighters as far out as 500 miles from its launching carrier. Now, it's important to consider how the location of refueling fueling operations can telegraph the intent of a mission, or potentially highlight the presence of stealth fighters on enemy radar scopes. But for the sake of simplicity, we'll leave that part of mission planning out in this hypothetical situation. Using the MQ-25 for refueling would mean that an F-35C taking off at 1,000 miles exactly from a target could top off at about 500 miles, putting it back up to a full tank of gas which is good for around 1,300 miles in a best-case scenario. From that 500-mile point, the F-35C would need to cover 500 miles out to target and then 500 miles back into the MQ-25's refueling range, which is around 1,000 miles. So in this highly simplified example, the F-35C really could feasibly reach targets as far as 1,000 miles out or even a bit further. But there's a big problem with it. It's incredibly optimistic. Aircraft don't actually operate at the outside end of their max maximum fuel ranges. And in fact, the Navy themselves are not nearly this optimistic about what the MQ-25 can do. A few years ago now, noted F-14 radar intercept officer, YouTuber, and friend of the channel, Ward Carroll, interviewed the Navy's Vice Admiral Mike Shoemaker for proceedings, alongside his friend Bill Hamlet. And at the time, the Admiral made it clear that the MQ-25 may be able to reach out to 500 miles, but realistically, it's only going to increase a fighter's range by 300 to 400 miles. And of course, at that 1,000 mile mark, carriers could still potentially be targeted this is really a minimum safe operating distance that we're talking about here. Now, the Navy's not in this fight alone, of course, and the Marine Corps and Air Force both have things in the works that could help. My old alma mater, the Marine Corps, has been experimenting with leveraging its short takeoff vertical landing F-35, the F-35B, from the decks of amphibious assault ships, and also from austere landing strips that could be set up inside China's area denial bubble. But it goes without saying that both of these strategies come with a great deal of risk. The F-35B has the smallest fuel stores of the Joint Strike Fighter family, with a combat radius of right around 500 miles, meaning both both these amphibious assault ships and these austere airstrips would have to operate not only within range of China's ballistic missile arsenal, but also while all but surrounded by China's naval forces. The more potent of these Band-Aid solutions come from the Air Force, and the first is already underway. That's integrating the Air Force's AGM-158B JASM-ER, or Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile Extended Range, into both the Super Hornet and the F-35C's arsenals. With a range of about 620 miles, these low-observable subsonic cruise missiles could offset the range limitations of both of these fighters. But these weapons are too big to be carried internally by the F-35, compromising its stealth and increasing the chances of intercept. The Air Force's other band-aid is its fleet of B-2 Spirits and its forthcoming fleet of B-21 Raiders, which really may be the best of the bunch. With accurate intelligence regarding the placement of long-range anti-ship systems, these strategic stealth bombers could fly out of the U.S. and ahead of a carrier strike group, wiping out known systems and reducing the efficacy of China's area denial approach. But again, none of these solve the Navy's range problem, they just help to offset it. So let's take our last few minutes to talk about how the FAXX program really can solve this problem. In order to keep America's carriers at least a thousand miles away, the FAXX needs a thousand mile combat radius, which is no small undertaking. That range would represent an increase of just under 50% over the F-35C, and an even better 1200 mile combat radius would be an 80% jump. 
The F-35C carries 19,200 pounds of fuel on board. That accounts for nearly a third of the aircraft's maximum takeoff weight, and it's actually about the same as a dry F-16 weighs in itself. To extend the F-35C's combat radius to that 1,000-mile mark, it would need another 9,600 pounds of fuel, which is about the same as adding a 2021 Nissan Titan to the F-16 we already have shoved into its fuselage. But of course, all that extra fuel would mean needing even more fuel in order to propel the added mass of the extra fuel. Basically speaking, the FAXX is just going to need to be bigger than either the F-35C or the F-A-18 that it's slated to replace in order to carry enough fuel for the job. But that problem could be offset some by incorporating next-generation adaptive cycle engines, like GE's XA100 that's currently in testing. I spoke to the guys building this engine last year, and they told me that it can offer a whopping 30% increase in range over existing engine designs, which would really reduce the fuel storage requirements for the FAXX. And in fact, incorporating this engine into the F-35C in the future could also bring it close to that 1,000 mile mark itself. And if you're asking, why go bigger when a smaller aircraft could potentially fly further faster for less fuel? The answer isn't just the need for fuel storage, but also the need for a much larger weapons bay to carry next-generation standoff weapons like the JASM ER or its ship-hunting sibling, the long-range anti-ship missile, internally, without compromising its stealth. Now, the Navy also said they want this fighter to be faster, which creates a bunch of other problems with radar-absorbent materials that have been a limiting factor on the F-35 B and C speed to date. Ceramic-based RAM, which is something I talked about in my video about how stealthy a fighter we could build, could help with that, as could the XA-100, because it doesn't just offer an increase in fuel efficiency, but also up to a 20% boost in thrust in some parts of the flight envelope. That alone, probably wouldn't cut it, so the FAXX may prove to be a twin-engine platform, which would give it more power, but again, at the expense of needing even more fuel. At the end of the day, the Air Force's NGAD program may draw most of the headlines, and it's likely to produce a fighter sooner, but the FAXX may actually be the more ambitious of the two. And while my deep fanboy love for the ASF-14 Super Tomcat concept just begs me to say I told you so, the truth is, if the FAXX can deliver on what the Navy's asking for, it may be one of the most revolutionary fighters we've ever seen. I went over a ton today, and there's still so much more to discuss about the FAXX. Let me know if you want another video on it. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below, and don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.